right, this was another huge album for me this year. His fault, he forgot him. <laughs> yeah, I forgot him. Um, this was one of my favorite albums that came out this year, even though I had to lay it down for a little while after I was really super into it. Um, this is the second cover, the lame version. Uh, Danzig's second album, Danzig 2, Lucifuge, is, um, he actually took a foray into kind of like blues doom metal. There's a lot of very bluesy guitar work on this album. Um, it is a pretty dark album as well, uh, but it was just like, it, man, it hit the spot when it came out for me. I loved it. Uh, I was very into Glenn's vocal style. Um, I liked that it wasn't a techni super technical album. It's very simple in its uh, in its delivery, but it, Glenn is just a good songwriter. Glenn, he's got strong songcraft skills, so it just really it worked for me completely. Um, my big cuts on here, most of them, but I'd say my my absolute favorites were Killer Wolf. Her Black Wings, Devil's Plaything is probably my favorite. Blood and Tears is great. It, it runs like a 50s ballad. You could have heard it on an Elvis album, you swear. Um, it's just a great album. Uh, 777 is a great song, too. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a better version of the cover, but I'd have to look it up. It's... Eh, fuck it, I'll look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Because the original cover, I think, is super cool, and I don't know why they changed it. It's kind of got that first Doors album look. Yep. And, I, and it's colorful. It's not black and white. Um, I don't know why they changed it. I've since I found a copy with the original cover. It was like a German import or something. <clears throat> but uh, it's a solid album if you are a Danzig fan, for sure. I would I would recommend it highly. His first two. First four are probably essential. First two are my favorites. What's next? Uh, let's see. Number ten. Number We're ten. up to our We're top, top 10. ten. Do we have to take an ice cream break or anything? Yeah, we can. We'll, we'll probably cut this video. I'm sure it's getting long. But uh. all right. So number ten. This is definitely a me thing. Um, I. So this is, like I said, a year that I was heavily into the Christian music, and I was looking for heavy bands. I mean, I had already liked Striper. I told you, I, you know, I found the Holy Soldier, which I dug. This was not your typical but, Christian. But band, this was though. not your typical Christian band whatsoever. I was driving, and I knew this band before I got rid of all my secular music, because mm. I was. This was in 1988, 89. I was driving a truck um, for a. Um, interior design company driving furniture and carpets and this kind of stuff. You mean like a CDL type truck? Yeah. You had big, to have a CDL for? Big box truck, yeah. Oh. So anyhow, I was driving the, the I did truck. I know that. I would drive it from New Jersey to New York, New Jersey to Philadelphia, and anyhow, uh, whenever I ran across a record store or a Christian bookstore, I'd stop and look for stuff. So I went into this one store and I came across this album that was just brutal. I had his hand with the, that was pierced with blood all over it. Yep. And I just popped it in. Remember they always had those little listening decks yep. in there? And I popped it in. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I gotta buy this. I loved it. So uh, that was Human Sacrifice, and I I wore that tape out. I bought it on cassette. Uh, anyhow, a year later, 1990, they came out with their second album, and it was this one, Once Dead. Um, this is an original pressing. It is autographed by all the original members, given to me by Larry Farkas. But I, lo I love that they used the Ozzy Dyer of a Madman font down here for the title. And when I redid it, I used the same font. So. Awesome. But in any case, the um, I, I bought this again from the same bookstore that Robert works at and he, I, I couldn't wait for this thing to come out and so the day it came out I was there picked it up got in my car I had I still had a cassette deck in my car and I bought a CD so I couldn't play it but I thought this cover was hilarious when I first looked at it I mean I guess it's got spiritual um, meaning behind it basically you know being born again so you're first life and being like born a, again. Like as but, a zombie though. But you're like zombies and they're all dirty and stuff. And the reissue of this, if you're into this album, the reissue of this is so cool because it's got all, a whole section about the album cover and how they created it. Because the, the guy who did the makeup for this is some famous Hollywood horror artist guy. Oh. And he, he, he supplied us with a bunch of really cool photos of them getting their makeup on. And oh, cool. you see all behind the scenes. Very cool. But anyhow, this is very raw, very aggressive, but very much different than Human Sacrifice. Why? Glenn Rogers wrote most of the songs in the first album, a lot of the songs. This album, it's it's a mixture of Larry Farkas, 
Doug Thiem and um, Roger Del Martin do, excuse me, Roger Martinez doing all the uh, all the writing. So okay, um, yeah, it's it's raw, it's intense. I love this song. So these songs. What song I honestly, here? I sang almost every song on this album at one point or another when I was singing for this band. Can't get out. Can't get out. Oh, space trucking's on this one. That's right. Yep. The, and I again, I thought you didn't cover "Can't Get Out," did you? On um, ultimatums? No, we covered. We did warfare the first song. Warfare. What okay. are we in? Warfare. What are we in? Warfare. We played it live for like two years after we put, did it too, because everybody always wanted to hear it. So yeah, I forgot about space trucking. Yep. And I love space trucking too. It's a ridiculous version of the song. Yep. Um, Roger Martinez's vocals were just ridiculous. But remember that? You remember? Were you there when that Larry Farkas was telling us about the story about? We ran out to dinner one time with Larry Farkas, and he's telling us a story about how Roger, I think you were there, how Roger came into the band and, and did some vocals for him. He's like, oh man, his vocals were awful, so we had to get him. Yeah, that's, <laughs> like, that's like the nacho story. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. I think it was the same night. I think it was. Larry's going, oh, those nachos look disgusting. Yeah, the, the waitress walks. What do you have? I love the nachos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we just walks by with this big pot plate of nachos for the table next to us. And, there, and, and, and Larry's, t he's, he's got the best facial expression. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, oh man, those nachos are disgusting. And then the waitress comes up and says, what he was like, oh, I'll have nachos. <laughs> I remember that. Because Justin was there too. Yep. And we, we, were crack, we cracked up over that one big time. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, great thrash album, so. Uh, All right, that was number ten. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Oh man, this is mostly you too. Oh well, I love this album as much as that one. We talked a little bit about this when we showed the recon. This is the second album from Deliverance. This album was huge for them. Uh, their first album was great. This album, I think, is just as good. Um, they, George Ochoa from Recon joined the band, and him and Jimmy Brown wrote all these songs together. Um, they did a video that became pretty big on MTV. Um, got played quite a bit on Headbangers Ball, and then when Les, when uh, Lars Ulrich was the guest DJ on one of the metal shows, he chose this as one of his favorite songs and favorite videos, so it, it, it basically exploded for them. Yep. So they were touring constantly for this album. And I remember, um, this was 1990, so let's say I started investigating Christian metal around 91, 92. And I remember this was recommended to me. I went into a store and a guy recommended it to me. And I remembered the cover and everything, and it just was not something I picked up. I, I never really listened to it. I, did, I don't think I really get into it until I met you. And I was in Tychus and, and everything. Then I started re-exploring some of this stuff. The one track I do remember really digging was 23. Which is an oddball track on the album. It's a little different. It's, it's very Metallica. Yes. Very. But very, but not like the fade to black kind. Fade of to black Metallica, yeah, not like you know, early, thrashy no. Metallica. So no, it was, it was ballady Metallica. Which I would describe. I mean, if you're a fan of the melodic Metallica stuff, like melodica, Metallica meets Queensrÿche. That's how I would describe this album. Yeah, uh, and a lot that. of people call it a thrash album. To me, it's more of a speed metal album because it's got very clean, high vocals. Oh man, the vocals on um, Flesh and Blood are just raging high. Um, and Bought by Blood as well. Bought by Blood, the vocals are very, very high. Um, matter of fact, that song, Bought by Blood, was originally written by George Ochoa for Recon. Recon never recorded it, so it ended up being recorded with Deliverance. Oh, so okay. There you go. Um, but when I saw Recon several times, they they always played that song, Flesh and Blood. I mean, excuse me, Bought by Blood. Um, it's kind of it's not a concept album, but it, it kind of has a, a, a theme that runs through it of spiritual warfare. So there you go. Slay the Wicked is a great song too. I just love this album. Greetings of Death is actually an early demo. It's the only old song on here. Um, that was one of their from their early demos. Matter of fact, the demo was called Greetings of Death, and I believe that was their 1987 demo. Awesome. And I'm, that album, I, I literally have like six or seven different vinyl copies of. All right, we are on number eight, and I was never really a big fan of this band, and I'll tell you why. What it started out was. I was in DT Seizure at the same time these band, these guys were breaking and they always felt like competition. And I, I don't know, I just took it weird. Um, Pantera, Cowboys from Hell, they this broke them nationally, this made them huge. Yep. Um, and I, I liked it okay when it came out, but again, like I said, it was, it felt like competition, but the Red Hot Chili Peppers felt like competition too for at the, that time to us, uh, even though it was completely different sound. Um, I remember when this came out, a lot of people thought it was their first album. 
No, it was like their fifth album. Right. <laughs> but their first four was were four, so different. The first one, two, three, four, four. This is their fifth. Sixth album, right? No, fifth. There was uh, magic metal music in, t in the jungle, in, in, in the, the night. Jungle metal or so. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because it was three power metal. Three albums with the original vocalist. And yeah. Then, then, then one with one, Phil, which was power metal. Yeah. And, and then, then this one. one. Okay. So second album with Phil, fifth album overall. But a definite departure in style from oh, those early albums. Time. The first three albums were more straightforward heavy metal. Yeah. People call them pop metal, but I, mean, I just didn't hear it. Whatever. Um, totally different band, wasn't, really. If it was pop metal, it definitely wasn't Poison. No. Uh, and power metal is freaking awesome. And man, Phil could sing on that album. Yeah. And, and then on here. He adopted a new style that really influenced a lot yeah. of singers, and I call it kind of an aggro kind of delivery, which personally I don't care for. I, I don't care for it, and I think that there have been a slew of bands that have imitated that style, vocalists that sing that way, and it took a lot of the dynamics out of vocals for me. Yeah, and, it, and they, kept, they kept getting more and more of that that vibe going on. Like I call it the uh, the angry. The uh, angry sergeant yelling at the lazy cadet style. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, the, um, the killer tracks on here for me personally, just as a casual listener, were the title track and Cemetery Gates. And Cemetery Gates, he, he he's pretty sing, heavy. And he sings on that song. Yeah. And he still sounds great. Yeah. I think it was probably in the last, well, I'm sure there was other parts, but that song he, he definitely sang on. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the track Cowboys from Hell, it's it's still played on you know rock radio oh, today. Yeah. I hear it on classic rock radio. It was a track that broke them, really. So, it just broke them huge nationally. It is my second favorite album from them after Power Metal. Pantera, Cowboys from Hell, 1990. Where are we? I didn't think we put that in the top 10 more out of the fact that we thought it deserved to be the for the influence, yeah. more so than it being an our personal favorite. No, it wasn't. I wouldn't put it in a top anything for me. I don't care for it, but um, I definitely understand the influence that it had. All right, speaking of influence, this Slayer, is number seven. Slayer, Slayer, Slayer. Slayer. Yep. Seasons in the Abyss. A se kind of a seasoning the obese. A follow up to South of Heaven, style wise. Uh, I I was I loved South of Heaven. We it was a big album for us in DTC. I remember we every one of us as we took showers, we were all living together at that time. We'd be listening to South of Heaven when it came out. That was our shower music. <laughs> There's just not a bad song on here. I mean, no. of course, I think the I don't know if it's a big song, but Dead Skin Mask is probably one of the more well-known songs on here, as well as the title track, of course. The title track's awesome. Yeah, but there's not a bad song on here, and this is just raw, aggressive thrash. And you know we must like it a lot if I put it above Anthrax and Deliverance and Vengeance and all those bands that I love so much. So Yeah, it was but a big album in 1990. It's, it, it's Slayer. And the funny thing is, after this, they slowed down a little bit. They did. But uh, this is just raw, fast. And you know, it doesn't get the same mention as... Um, Rain and Blood. Thank you. Yeah, Rain and Blood. It just doesn't, but... Uh. Well, I mean, up to Rain and Blood, Slayer were flat-out thrash. They were just... That's what they did. After Rain and Blood with South of Heaven, they started to chill and evaluate, reevaluate things, and they tried some different things. And then the same thing on this, really. Yep. I think this is the last of the legendary Slayer albums, I'll say. No, nah, I think the one that followed it was too. Um, I don't know. I can't remember which one was after this one. I'm, I'm brain farting. That's why I didn't say it. Why are we brain farting so much? Because it's getting later and later. <laughs> We've been up all damn day long. Another two. Anyhow, um, we've been on the sun all day with children screaming birthday parties. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter. It's 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 classic Seems Slayer. Like I mean, yeah. it's everybody. You guys know who Slayer is. Give me a break, come on. <laughs> right. And oddly enough, I. This, I do have this album on vinyl. It's it, We couldn't find it in a reasonable amount of time. We were like, just, just grab the CD. I mean, you know, it's been two and a half years since we did one of these. We're a little rusty <laughs> in our, you know, our our process, yeah. you know, and apparently. Okay. Slayer, Slayer. Where are we next? Okay. One of my last lame ones which I was really upset about this one because I loved this album when it came out. It was a huge album for me. Um, and I'm sure it was a huge album for a lot of you, too. Alice in Chains, Facelift. 
I have it on vinyl at home. I have it on CD at home. Just forgot to bring them. I don't have it at all. No. Alice in Chains wasn't one of your things. Nope. Um, but it's funny because Alice in Chains is like the missing link between metal and grunge. And grunge right. wasn't really a thing when this came out. They were a Seattle band, but they weren't really called grunge at this point. No, they were touring with, they toured, didn't they do the, they did the big tour with Anthrax and Megadeth? Oh yeah. And, and, yeah, they uh, were still kind of, Slayer. they had their feet in the metal camp for sure. And they still do, really. I don't think they ever fully fell down that grunge rabbit hole. But this album broke them nationally, Man in the Box was a massive single. It's probably still their biggest single to date. I mean, huge. Who doesn't know Man in the Box? Yeah. <laughs> I remember hearing uh, those those other bands, Slayer and Anthrax, and talking about those guys being on that tour and think, uh-oh, things are changing. Things are changing, and also, I've heard them talked about that it was really tough for them at first because the crowds are really hard on them. Yep. But they basically, they just marched out there and were like, fuck you, we're going to win you over. And they did. They totally did. I mean, to me, Alice in Change is like the band that has had the shit beat out of them more than any other I can think of, except maybe Def Leppard, except Def Leppard went, they got kind of wonky after they got the shit beat out of them. Alice in Change just got tougher and they just kept going. And I, I have a great respect for this band because they, they um, their music helped me through a very difficult period of my life, big time. But when this came out, the first track I heard from them was We Die Young. And my initial reaction was, damn, that kind of sounds like Armored Saint. For Lane Staley reminded me of John Bush, who I always thought was a great vocalist, loved his vocal style. And there was just, but there was this massive riff that he's singing over and I just, I loved it immediately. And the whole album, I won't say it's my favorite Alice in Chains album. I would save that from for the next one probably. But there's not a song in here I don't like. It's very great songwriting and you can't really outdo Lane's vocals. He was a real mainstay for the 90s as far as a unique vocal delivery. And you can't really imitate him easily either, I don't think. And Jerry Cantrell is probably one of my favorite songwriters of all time as well. So we've got great songcraft going on, great delivery band-wise, and I just think it's it was just all the makings of something really classic and uh, long-lasting, and I still love them. They're still in my top five favorite bands of all time. Alice in Chains, Facelift, 1990. Divine Intervention, that was the Slayer album we were both trying to think of. Is that the one with the skeleton like hanging yes. on? Okay, I remember. And I'm not that familiar with it. I was like, that was, Seasons in the Abyss was like my, my out exit for Slayer, I guess. I always liked the SOD's take on that. Did you ever see their single? Yes. Oh yeah, Seasons in the Abyss. Yeah. yeah. This was another big album for me. Uh, now, whereas he, he talked about these bands where he like, you know, he used to talk about Testament where he was like, oh, I listened to these first three albums and I kind of dropped them and I just, this. This is where I was at Queensryche. I was a huge Queensryche fan. Yep. This is, this is Empire. And, and this um, was a big turning point. I was in high school when the EP came out. And I yep. bought the EP as a new release and I loved the EP. Same here. And then the warning came out and I loved the warning. I mean, I just ate it yep. up. And then, again, and then they came out with uh, Mind Crime and I was like, hey. What? Rage for Order. You forgot Rage for That's Order. That's what I said. I said but that. Rage for Order was real different too. It was, but I liked it a lot. Yeah. But then Mind Crime came out and it was like, uh, to me, it just, it didn't hit me like the other ones. It didn't have the metal left. Right. It was very commercial, very... And this would be even more so, which but is obviously Empire. Empire, yeah, if we didn't say it. But then, but, Massive hit for them. But I actually like this album as better than Minecraft. Mind Crime. Yeah. Well, I'll say, like I said, I've said this before, and I, I, only, I say this so much because there was so much going on inside of myself. 1990 was a pivotal year. Um, the band that I was in, you know, for three years was, I was about to exit it just when we were about to do something bigger than we uh, had previously done. And this came out right about that same time. And I remember the opening track, Best I Can, was a real positive statement in, a, in kind of a, you know, most metal wasn't making those kind of positive statements at this point. It was all darkness and, oh my God, despair and all this stuff. But this one was like, yeah, best I can. I'm going to rise above it and all that. And it really hit me because I was looking for that kind of a statement somewhere. And I just think it 
because it hooked me immediately with that first track, I was more open to the rest of the album. And it's still one that I like to revisit. It's just a, it's just a great album to listen to, and it's just. And it was a commercial success for it too. Oh, big time! Silent City was a massive single. Yep. Off of that, was there any other singles on here that was? I think the Empire was a single. Jet City yep. Woman. Was Jet a City single. Woman was definitely was. And yeah, and then the, uh, what was the B side track? Scarborough. Scarborough uh, Fair. Fair. That was also a radio. Yeah. I don't know if it was a hit, but I heard it on the radio quite a bit. So. I think this was a unique period for them. This album and the one after it, they had that kind of sound that was really working, and people were really digging. Um, then I'm not sure what happened, but oh, what do I have? Two covers in here. I don't remember. Two of the same covers? No, two different covers. Two different oh, that's booklets. Weird. And that's my one complaint about this album is the cover album. The art, album art blows, in my estimation. I don't like it at all. I don't. I never understood why it was bitmapped. I guess. I guess. I mean, obviously. I mean, digital on. digital art wasn't what it is today, and in 1990. I don't know why they chose that. But even either. in 1990, I, I knew it was it was odd looking, but I'm sure they did it on purpose. But I don't know. I don't know why they did it. But I've never cared for it. I think if if it didn't have that pixely look it look to it, I probably would like it better. But it just always looked rushed. Whatever. Queensrÿche Empire, huge album, really. We're in our top five now. I think we're just about there. That was number five. Number five. Oh. <laughs> number four. It was probably a massive album for both of us. Oh, I yeah. I think. <laughs> Third album from this band. Oh, so into this album. I was too. Now, they, a lot of people called, back then, I remember people calling them a Christian band. They were never really a, they were, they were a mainstream band. But they had a sound. They were, they were a band of believers. I would say that. At the time they were. Yeah. Yep. But they had a sound unlike any other really I, yeah. I didn't think they sound like anybody else it was retro but it was also fresh yeah it had the massive grooves yeah it had um, these unusual vocals um well doug's vocals were very soulful um yep. and i love his voice but Ty also, Tabor was very melodic melodic almost beatlesque but his sound. together they had they had those beatles harmonies for sure yep and uh i remember i think the first track i ever heard was it's love and i was like wow what the hell is this i Love this. Oh, it's love. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Wilson, Moan yep. Jam. That that's it. That is exactly what it is. A jam. It is. It's awesome. Some great guitar playing in there. Six Broken Soldiers. Just just again soulful song. Very uh, and the and very thoughtful lyrics. Yes. As I'm well. trying to think of I'll, the, I'll never I'm, get tired I'm of not, you. I'm not coming. I can't think of the right word to describe Six Broken Soldiers. But it's it's not a ballad. It's, no, it's um. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. It's it's hard. It's just it's very it's very mindful music. It's very intelligent music. It's very well done. Very well played. The delivery is very passionate. Uh, what's another great? Uh, Legal Kill is the closer, and that's a great track. I, I I mean a lot of people call it progressive metal too, or progressive rock, sort of. and, and they had the progressive sound too. Then they sort of. Um, and I, the, the last song, Legal Kill, I always really like too. And I, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't that an abortion song? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. But it, it could mean, be interpreted that way, I think. Probably. But anyhow, that kind of uh, appropriate for what's been going on the last few weeks. But uh, And then the title track is fantastic. Yeah. So th this easily could have been... And, and you got to show the back cover. I used to have this image hanging on my fridge for years. I love that picture. I loved it. I cut it out of my CD long box oh, yeah. that I had. and uh, Yeah. And I, I've, I've always. This is one of those covers. Have you, ever, have you ever looked at those? Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. This it's one of those albums that has all this like it, it, it from you know the distance. It just looks like lettering. It's yeah, but it's all these etchings in the letters. It's like it almost tells a story. story. Uh, it's one of those things you can just like stare at yeah. while you're listening to the music and just it's just so much. Yeah, that's straight out of the '70s. And really, this sound is harkening back to stuff that you heard in the '70s, but it's got a modern edge to it. Definitely. Yeah, it's heavy. Oh yeah, it's, but it's not. It's down tuned, so it's got that that heavy sound to but it. But I, I can't really comfortably say that they're heavy metal. There's metal elements for sure. For sure. But they're a bit more proggy than. It's weird. It's hard to tell. Every band's unique, especially and they have a bands. Groove. They have a groove too. Yeah, they so definitely it, are groovy. So anyhow, yeah, this one. I uh, love this album for we, years. Neither, neither both one. of us. It had to be in the top five. Oh yeah. So we're at number three. Yeah, we are number, number three. Oh boy, this was a big one too. These are fun to talk about because they we were so we we're right into them. <laughs> yeah, this album's 
great. All right, so uh, this band was kind of reborn with this release, uh, and they decided to go with the self-titled album, even though they'd already had a self-titled album in 1984. Which everybody calls Psalm 9. Psalm 9. Days. So they retroactively retitled it Psalm 9, yep. so as not to confuse it with this one. And Trouble was one of the Sabbath Disciple bands, along with St. Vitus and Pentagram. And they really upped their sound on this one and their production. Yeah, well, they really. Who produced it? It was, um, it was Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin, who also produced Slayer at Danzig. And Danzig. And, yep. and, and he did a lot of rap stuff before he came to producing, you know, more heavier bands too. But this album, I remember hearing Psychotic Reaction. That was like the first video on MTV. And I'm going, oh my God, I. I want to sound like trouble. <laughs> I want to sound like trouble. I, I want to. That's the direction I want to go so in. So those first three albums were very much people would call them doom metal. I, I don't know that they ever were, they were they were doom metal, but they, they got. I a, think doom is a retroactive tag. Yeah, this here was more of a. Uh, there was more groove. There was more. Uh, still had a still bit of a, firmly steeped in Sabbath for sure. But had a heavy '70s vibe. Um, which they got more into as they these went. days people call stoner rock, but I, I just it's hard to for, for me it's just it's just trouble. It sounds like trouble to me. Nobody else sounds like trouble. And uh, man, the guitar tone he's got such a unique tone. You just know I, it's. I in. remember reading interviews with uh, James Hetfield saying they played with Trouble and they were talking to Bruce, Spring, Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> Bruce Franklin about how did you get that? How do you get that sound out of your amp? And he's kind of coaching them on what he was doing to get that tone. Which is cool. I think that's that's pretty neat. Yep, great album. I, I, that's and R.I.P. Eric Wagner. Honestly, this could have been number one, number two for me as well. I mean, I. I but you'll see why we pick. I, I think you'll agree with our number one and number two picks as well. Yeah, there's not a bad song on here. Nope, the excellent Wolf all the way great. through. Yeah, it's, it's it's hard for me to say it's my favorite Trouble because I I really like those. It's songs. just it's it's probably <laughs> one of their most solid albums. It's yeah. so well put together. But I just, I just love Trouble the first Trouble album so much. I do too. And I think my favorite cuts at the end of my days for sure. I love it. Psychotic Reaction, love it. Uh, R.I.P. is cool. Black Shakes of Doom. Heaven's on my mind. It's just a great album all the way through. Yep. It really is. Awesome. Trouble. And, I, and I'll say that I think the follow-up is as good. Uh, Manic Frustration? Mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely. They're definitely getting more... I, I was beginning to hear more Beatles influences in there, too. Yes, definitely. They even did a couple of Beatles covers. Yeah, they did. At some point. All right, so number two and number one. This Why this album didn't keep metal thriving in the 90s. I mean, when I, when I first heard this, I was like, oh my god, metal is back. <laughs> Wow! The painkiller video, I was just like, damn. After yeah. after Turbo and Ram It Down, which I liked, but they were definitely watered down. Wow, they come screaming back with this one. And again, I, there's not a song here I don't like. What an album. I mean, it starts off with something that leans close to thrash or speed metal. It's yeah. not I wouldn't call it thrash, but it definitely has a it's speed metal. Damn sound. close. And that and the drumming was oh, so yeah. improved. Over Dave Holland. I mean, yeah, Scott, Scott, Scott um, Travis, Scott Travis, a beast, yes. formerly of Racer X before this, and now he's been with them longer than anyone else. Yep, and, he, mean, also, and he was also with Fight too. So, yep, that's right. And he's a tall mofo. He's like taller than me. I'm six four, and he's got to be like six nine or something. But big old lanky drummer motherfucker. <laughs> he's awesome. <laughs> and he's a, he's actually the only member of Priest they ever got to meet in person. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, they, they played a show. It was when they were, nobody cared about them. They played a show at a little club in Albuquerque with uh, Ripper singing for him. And he came out afterwards. And I, I just shook his hand and it's a great show. That's that was, cool. That was the end of it, but it was still cool. I was, you know. I mean, just when you think Priest has gone away, they come back and they just punch you in the face with something like this. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it was quite, at the time, it was a quite the swan song for Rob Halford because, you know, he left after this one, but. Hell Patrol was on here. That yep. was a uh, between the hammer and the anvil. Yes, a touch one. of evil was a more melodic uh, track. A, a that was the of, first. Was one of the first singles. That, that's actually you could have put that song with "Screaming for Vengeance" and, and it wouldn't have. Yeah. It, it would have fit perfectly. Uh, Battle Hymn was great. Leather um, Rebel. Leather Rebel. Yeah, that's just not a bad song on here. It's just it's straight up. It's just like, oh, you thought Priest was done? 
here, have this. Yeah. <laughs> and the cover's great, too. It is. It, it's, it's just one of their, it's, it's one of their most iconic covers. It's classic. One of them. They had a lot of iconic covers, but that was... And, you know, of course, one. the painkiller was that continuing character that Rob had been writing about since, like, Exciter on, yeah. the, on the Stained Class album. Yeah, was it the hero... The, yeah. The, the hero it's kind of like savior that's burning across the sky and Just burning away every evil thing. Destroying evil, yeah. yeah. And it's funny because it, that they're considered one of those bands that was evil. They were one of the one of the 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 evil stepchildren that the PMRC hated. But not if you really listened to what he was saying. And they're the ones that got pulled into court for you know. Yeah, that was freaky. So yeah. Anyway, number one. Number one. I I hope you agree with us. I we agreed on it pretty readily. Immediately. Right off the bat. Rest in peace, Megadeth. Dave is back with a brand new lineup. Uh, well, the two Daves are still there, of course. Brand new drums, brand new second guitar player, and their most successful album to date. Dave is clean. I mean, the band's clean. They look healthy, and they're just... I remember hearing Holy Wars on the radio prior to the album coming out. It was like a Z-Rock premiere. And I was so damn jealous of that, the sound they had on that song. I'm just like, oh my god, I hate this. <laughs> but it was so good. The whole album is awesome from start to finish. I, I think this put them to a whole new level. It I mean, did. Uh, not only a level musician-wise and production-wise, but popularity-wise as oh, well. Oh yeah. I remember seeing them on talk shows playing Hangar 18. Like Arsenio Hall and uh, shows like that. Yep. And I just and Hang Right Teen is one of those songs I can't get enough of it. Maybe I've heard it a million times, but I damn I love it. Yep. I don't know why it just kicks in that da na 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 na. Love it. Uh oh, what's that mean? Did you Where see that? Yeah, we just ran out of chip. <laughs> you, you mean this is not being recorded? I think it was a warning. All right. Well, this is number one. I mean, do you have anything else you want to say about it? No, it's it, actually we're running out of batteries. What we're doing? So okay, we've been talking for a long time. <laughs> so it opens up with an epic classic, "Holy Wars: The Punishment Due," and it closes with an epic classic, "Rust in Peace: Polaris." Yep, it's like awesome, like Rain and Blood. It's got these bookends that a, just and then everything in between is, is great. killer. Yep, it's so just killer. Rust in Peace. Megadeth, one of my all-time favorite albums from Megadeth. It's yep, to this day. So, well, that's it. That's our top thirty-five for nineteen ninety. We Sorry were, it took us two and a half years. <laughs> we're running out of battery, so we got to fly, but uh, definitely leave a message below. And